Hi, everyone. Wow, what a crowd. Um, this is amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm Serafina Albadri Nance, and I'm the author of Starstruck, a memoir of astrophysics and finding light in the dark. As a debut author and a graduate student, I just don't really know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> But it is nothing short of an honor to be here amongst you all and amongst such brilliant and talented authors. The universe is 14 billion years old and 93 billion light years across. It is a cosmos built upon fragments of molecules and pinwheels of stars strung together by the forces of nature. Vast, endless, and nearly impenetrable, it is a cosmos of dreams. Mm -hmm. I've always loved the stars. As young as five years old, I listened to NPR's Stardate on the way to school. I was a really cool kid. <laughs> At night, I stargazed with my dad and relished the opportunity to be still with one another. Even as a child, I was really easily overwhelmed by anxiety. But the night sky was my balm. Stargazing with my dad were moments I held sacred when the vast silence of the universe drowned out the noise of the world. During the summer of fifth grade, I attended science camp. I told you I was a cool kid. And for the first time in my life, I met a professional astronomer. With the unbridled, naked enthusiasm of a kid, I told him that I want to be an astronomer when I grow up. He replied in that curt, cynical way of somebody comfortable in their privilege, no, you don't. This is not for you. His words burrowed like ticks in my mind, and I became acutely conscious to the notion of being perceived, flattened, categorized, and assumed. Questions riddled with self-doubt flooded my core and fractured my sense of self, imprinting a message that was explicitly and implicitly reiterated over the years. What am I cut out for? And do I belong? I grew up in Texas, the daughter of a first-gen Egyptian mother and a white American dad. My mom fled a war-torn Egypt as a child, bouncing from one country to the next until she immigrated to the States as a teenager. From her, I learned how to code switch between my public Americanized self and my private Arab one. She frequented salons that fried and straightened her wild, beautiful Egyptian curls, and I, a childlike mirror, begged for a cheese straightener for my 10th birthday. I adopted a Starbucks name in the tradition of many other people of color. Sarah orders a burger, but Serafina devours Malachia back at home. I was privileged to visit Egypt often. And during those trips, reacquainted myself with my middle name, El Badri, relishing in the way it fit in with my two dozen Egyptian family members and the pyramid splitting the sky. In the wake of 9-11 came the war on terror. Xenophobia and anti-Arab racism surged, jingoism at a fever pitch, reflecting the rot of an already racist society. In my third grade classroom, a classmate called me a terrorist, and I begged my mother to stop speaking Arabic to me in public, then in private. I chose to forget or self-erase my own name, El Badri. This was not an act born of shame, but of self-preservation. Navigating the complicated multiplicities of ourselves is not a singular struggle but one with which immigrants and people of color are intimately familiar. In the case of Arabs, 
Our task is to straddle invisible lines drawn by colonial and imperial powers to, to dehumanize and brutalize. We are paradoxically perceived as exotic, yet invisible. We represent both the caricature of a backwards camel riding nomad and the symbol of abject terror. I felt as though I had to prove my own humanity, and as such, I became an expert in making myself palatable, untethering myself from a culture coursing through my very blood. I was enamored by the universe, in part because I could not yet make sense of my place in the world. I learned in middle school our precise cosmic address, planet Earth, the solar system, the Milky Way, the local group, the Virgo supercluster, the observable universe, the universe. But what I did not understand is where I belong when I am torn between two worlds. I took my first astrophysics class in 11th grade and was enchanted. My teacher, Mikan, was grizzled and wise, exactly whom I'd expect to instruct us in the wonders of the universe. Astrophysics is the ultimate field of exploration. We do not know where the universe ends or how it will meet its demise. We do not even know what the universe is made of. Over 95% is unknown and unseen, that which we call dark energy and dark matter. From Mikan, I was encouraged to question everything. The unknown was the domain of scientists, and it was here that Mikan ushered me in, questioning and evidencing, analyzing and concluding. To Mikan, what makes a scientist isn't that we satisfy some antiquated criteria reinforced by tradition. White, brilliant, most often men of privilege and means. No, to Mikan, scientists are those of us driven by an inimitable curiosity to explore the unknown. For me, Mikan opened the gates to the stars. At university, I double majored in physics and astronomy, and I struggled a lot. Not only was there a prodigiously steep learning curve in all of my classes, but I was always looking around to see how I measured up. I was by no means the most brilliant nor the most well-read, but it was more than that. I constantly felt out of place. I was one of two girls in my quantum mechanics course in a class of 50, and this was not uncommon. Nobody looked like me, none of my fellow students, not one of my teachers. Nothing disabuses you of hope like the sense of being completely and utterly alone. I was swallowed by feelings of non-belonging. And yet, a desperate ferocity of will and unmet curiosity drove me forward. Although classes were difficult and often felt impossible, I scoured the earth for ways to reconnect with the universe. After my first term at university, my dad, sensing my mounting frustration, drove us eight hours west to the McDonald Observatory. Together, we gazed through telescopes trained upon distant galaxies full of hundreds of billions of stars. And it was there in the middle of the darkest skies in America that I remembered my why. It was not, in my dad's words, to become an A-plus problem solver in my physics classes. I wanted to untangle the mysteries of the universe. And that's when I began to research exploding stars. I found a research mentor, Dr. Wheeler, who taught me how to model supernova and apply the physics I'd so laboriously poured over in thorny textbook problem sets. This was, in Dr. Wheeler's words, the fun part. With Dr. Wheeler's guidance, I learned how to sharpen my scientific tools. What were once unintelligible Greek symbols scrawled across the blackboard now held a deep and enduring meaning. I was building my fluency 
in the language of the universe. And in this process, I began to prove to myself what I was capable of. All of that is to say, I learned to reject cliched convictions about who I was and what I was capable of. This was the power of my education and my educators. I'd begun to understand that I had internalized cultural stereotypes that drew boxes around each of us, fashioning our fates and our futures. To be clear, I could not yet see how to break free, but thanks to my dad and Mike in and now Dr. Wheeler, I was no longer alone. With their guidance, I'd glimpsed the shadow of the universe beyond those glittering stars and acquired a courage to persist. I refused to bow to the shackles of social conditioning and rather than allow them to obliterate my sense of self, instead drew from myself a radical new conviction that my identity, my dreams, and my future is for me to define. I resisted the fear of not being good enough. I knew that if I did not define myself, I would be imprisoned by the fantasies of others. In finding my place in the universe, I began to understand my place on this planet. The universe was my ballast, my ground, and my sky, my compass. Hundreds, maybe thousands of hours spent poring over derivations and many, many supernova simulations later, physics began to come a little bit more easily. I graduated university at the top of my class and delivered the commencement speech to my college. I presented my supernova research at an academic conference and was awarded with an acceptance to my dream school, UC Berkeley. I published one paper, two, then three, enough to finally cement my place in astrophysics, at least in the eyes of others. And then tragedy struck. On the precipice of starting grad school, my dad was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. Through the rounds of chemotherapy and radiation, we learned that he carries the cancer-causing BRCA2 mutation and that I carry it too. The mutation gives me an 87% lifetime risk of breast cancer and a 30% lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. For me, cancer was no longer the dim specter possibility, but more than likely a certainty. Yet, as I delved into my research and lay under the stars at night, I would remind myself of how small we are and how our lives and deaths are just blitz in the universe. And I found that even as my world fell apart, tragedy did not own me. From my path in science, I knew the importance of advocating for myself. I understood that the power of an education would open doors I did not even know existed. And so I buried myself in articles on genetics and PubMed papers on breast cancer. I learned of preventative measures that I could take to reduce my risk. It was then that I made the difficult but empowering decision to get a preventative double mastectomy. The amputation reduced my risk of breast cancer from 87% to less than 5%. Three successful surgeries and three years later, I modeled in the pages of Sports Illustrated Swimsuit Magazine, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> I flew in zero gravity and became certified in open water scuba diving. I participated in an analog astronaut mission in collaboration with NASA, where my crew and I lived and worked as though we were astronauts on Mars. In short, I resigned from the acrobatics of swinging between palatable, reductive versions of myself and climbed back into my body into a soul that dreams. In finding my place in astronomy, I found myself. In particular, the last five months has wrought an internal awakening, or rather lit a pathway home. 
rhetoric from the war on terror has been refreshed and reprised. Arabs, Palestinians, ISIS, and Hamas are flattened into a monolith of terroristic, beastly barbarians. I watch in abject horror as we approach 30,000 Palestinians killed, the highest civil civilian casualty rate of the 21st century, according to UN Special Rapporteur Michael Link. But I no longer feel torn between two cultures. I have met, through the stories of Palestinians and Arabs in the diaspora, a selfhood that encompasses all of me. I carry with me the names of Hisham Awatini, Kenan Abdel Hamid, Tahseen Ahmad, and Wadea Al Fayyum, Palestinians who have been shot, and in the case of six year old Wadea, stabbed and killed in America just for being Palestinian. I can hear the power in reclaiming my name, El Badri, by my own tongue. There is no scientist, advocate, analog astronaut, model, some haphazard list of accolades plucked out of myself that represent who I am in its entirety. I refuse to banish myself. For much of my career, I felt alone. But I've come to understand that there are others before us and others to come. We are the connective tissue between our ancestors and our children. It is up to us how we weave that tissue together and re-inhabit our bodies, ourselves. Writing Starstruck was a journey of falling in love with my full humanity. It was important to me not to glamorize the suffering and pain of my life. They marked me forever. In a world built upon abusive pillars of oppression endures by tearing us apart. We forego our collective power when we are disembodied and numb to one another. But emotional truth-telling in the form of storytelling is an antidote for this disease of hyper-individualization. In Starstruck, I wanted to push myself into that transparent, uncomfortable territory where I feel deeply, openly, and vulnerably, that in which I feel wholly myself. And so I wrote this book out of necessity, not simply because representation is important, although it undoubtedly is. Women make up just 34% of the current science and engineering workforce, and of this 34%, women of color make up less than 10 but even more than that, as Bell Hooks once said, no one is healed in isolation. Whether it is other marginalized students in STEM or patients fighting for medical care or simply anyone struggling against the confinements of society's boxes, we get free together. My pain and my joy are entwined with yours. My liberation is bound up in your own. Ultimately, this is the power of stories, to help us feel less alone, to see ourselves in its pages and encounter those experiences that we never could have imagined. And in that collective understanding, we discover how to topple systems of oppression and dream up our own world. By understanding the universe within myself, I have learned to understand the universe around me. That is how we recall our agency. That is how we come home to ourselves. Thank you.